Yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, this meeting of the High Street Town and City Centre Commission. Um, joined today by um, some councillors and some officers. I'll read out their names um, so that we don't have to spend time doing introductions. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Councillor Samantha Dixon, Councillor Samantha <coughs> Dave, Sam Naylor, Councillor Charles Byfield, Councillor Lynn Gibbon, um, and hopefully Councillor Gillian Edwards as well. Um, and we're also joined by two officers, which is Steph Ramsden and Beth Skinner. Uh, feel free to uh, introduce yourself, councillors and officers, when you first speak. Um, the usual declarations of interest probably apply, but if you want to say yours, Charles, you're more than welcome to do so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to confirm, I'm uh, Charles Fyfield, so I represent Weaver and Cunningham Ward. My declaration of interest is um, I'm a Chartered Surveyor, I'm a Director of Fyfield Glynn Limited uh, that lets and sells commercial property including within West Cheshire and within town and city centres that we're discussing. But uh, again, uh, I just want to declare that for open. Cool. Thank you, Charles. That's very good. OK, we'll move on to the next, uh, the main section of the um, meeting, really, which is the review of the recommendation of the report and the next steps. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of any other business at the end, so I'm going to try and leave some time just to talk about how people have found being involved in the commission, what they would, if there's anything they would have done differently or anything that you think that we've missed. Um, so I'll leave some time for that, but um, we'll go into the main section. I hope everybody's had a chance to look at the slides. Um, I think that there's been some staffing changes in inside the regeneration team, which I'm, I'm sure Steph will cover when she um, comes to present her slides. But the, the main body of the report is written. Um, I think the bit that the officers need some support with is just about the, um, the structure of the recommendations. So what we're proposing to do in today's meeting, I know some people probably were expecting to have the report, but in, to, to go through this slide deck, look at the recommendations from each meeting that we had, and then to circulate the report uh, by Wednesday next week, so within the next seven days, so that we can all have a read of the final draft, if you like, and then either submit our comments by email or if the Commission feels like it needs to meet again, then I'm, I'm obviously happy to do that. Um, so I think Steph's going to take us through each of the sections and the sections are divided into the sessions that we've um, attended over the last couple of months. And then if you've got any points that you want to raise during each session, section, if you like, put your hand up and then at the end of the slides for that session, we can have comments and um, discussion and questions and, and everything else. Does that sound okay? Good. Over to you, Steph. Thanks, Councillor Beecham. Thanks, councillors. Um, so I think Beth's going to share the screen just so that we've all got them in front of us so that we can go through them one by one. And I think as Councillor Beecham said, we really wanted to make sure that we're framing the recommendations in the right way. So we've gone through, we've trawled through the evidence, the videos, the different submissions that came through and all of the presentations and we've tried to gather all of the comments into those themes and into the feedback and then consolidate those into some really good um, recommendations that, that then we can maybe develop in, in into the next steps of an action plan or or, or something like that. Um, so I thought the best way to do it was to go through the sessions um, pick up on part of the evidence that came through and some of the key themes that were presented um, and then take us through to those recommendations. I think as Councillor Beecham said, um, we've had we've had some absence in, in the team and also Caroline will be moving on to a new role who has been instrumental in this commission. Um, so I think we um, she's not with us today, unfortunately, um, but I, I, I'll be leading on this going forward. So Beth, if you could just go forward a couple of slides, please. Right, so I think the first session, we were obviously framing the, the commission itself. We, we reviewed all of the previous reports and actions and, and progress, which we've captured in the report. Um, I think those recommendations, so we had a presentation from Sonia Cabrillo, who is a High Street Task Force appointed expert from the Institute of Place Management, which is commissioned by the government. Um, and then we had some baseline evidence presented by myself that was um, captured from the JSNA and some of the more recent um, economic data that's been presented through ONS. Steph, um, it's Sam. I'm not getting anything on my screen. Oh, right. Um, is everybody else getting it? 
Yeah, if you click yes. on the bottom, Sam, if you click along the bottom, you might be able to see uh, the slides. And if you if you click your mouse on that, um, on the, the one that looks like a screen, it should come up big on your on your main screen, if that makes sense. It does make sense, but I can't see anything that looks like um, a screen. I, I can see the slideshow and so I think I. everybody else. Yeah, I can. Yes. I can too. Go on, ca carry on then. I'll, I'll follow it with what you're kind of saying. I did read them last night. Um, okay, brilliant. Um, so I think on the slide, the key themes, it's slide four, if, if you've got those in, in front of you, Sam. Um, so the key themes that came out of the presentation um, was around the high street decline was accelerated due to the pandemic. Footfall was declining. There'd been a real decline in consumer confidence of going out into busy places. Um, retail habits had changed. Um, and a move to online shopping and delivery was was really prevalent. I think on some of the other reports, I think we'd, we, we'd heard that there'd been an acceleration by about 12 years in terms of the move onto online. Um, but some of the positive things that, that had come out of the pandemic, um, dare I say it, the re-emergence of local places, community and local stores, people really staying local to, to, to get their produce, um, in some instances, mo instances moving away from um, mass multiple shopping um, and really looking at local providers. Um, really using some of those artisan producers who are maybe direct direct delivering to consumers where they haven't done that before. Um, and what we've seen is some of the innovation around local collaborative internet selling, which I think there were some great examples in Northwich and also Chester on that. Um, and I think some of the resources that have been made available through the Government Commission's High Street Task Force um, have been a real uh, opportunity for us to share some of that best practice. So I think from the data and from the evidence base, if we just move through to the recommendations, please, Beth. So I think through the evidence, we did identify that from our existing data set, there was some gaps in there. So I think some of the examples of around that was how footfall was captured, um, some of the national trends about footfall, um, vacant units, um, and really understanding some, some of that data. Do you want me to stop for questions, Councillor Beecham, or do you want do you want to take them at the end? Yeah, Char Charles has got a question and I've got a couple of comments as well. So if anybody else has got uh, anything they want to say at this stage, pop your hand up. But Charles, feel free to go first. Yeah, and apologies if this is within the um, the data folder, which I can't access. Um, but uh, on that initial meeting, one of the things that we did uh, comment, I mean, other than the um, that print off, which had the um, the facts and the figures, which I think we were going to go through in in slightly in a slightly different way. The other thing was that you provided a document um, that showed, as you went and said, what had uh, what had effectively been done from the previous um, commission. And I think on that one, all that I'd gone and asked was that I think there were eleven um, conclusions and seven recommendations. And I just asked in relation to that so that it was uh, more clearly identified which conclusion and recommendation and where they were. So apologies if that's already been done, um, but that was something that I think we were quite keen because I'm assuming that whatever the, the final report is going to have a couple of appendices and those appendices will include bits like that in there. Yes, it will. Just just to, to to reassure that it will reflect back on progress. So we've done a pro a more, a more detailed progress report, um, and 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 some of that detail. I, I did think we had sent it out, but I will double check. And if not, it's it's in our shared area, so we will be able to follow up with with, with a link through to that to that document. That's great. My um, my comments quickly were just going to be about the. The 25 priorities and the four R's. I mean, this this is exactly what I want to get out of this commission. I want to have, see these for for the for the areas we're targeting, the high streets that we're targeting, and I, I want to see where we are as a baseline to start with. And I want us to have a group of people who are um, working together to try and deliver improvements against those. And then I want the commission to kind of re meet so we can see how we've how we've done. And I think using these models that we've learned about, um, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel if this professional people out there from you know recognized institutes that are already coming up with these ideas i think that's fine it's just 
when you read through these um, uh, reports, you know, um, that different places are, are producing, what I want us to have is an actual localised somehow way of knowing what we're doing, what are our targets, what are relevant to each of those high streets, who's responsible for delivering it and whether or not they're actually delivering against it. That's what an rag rating or however we want to do it. But that, that's the thing that I want to get out of there. So I'm glad that these two things have been picked up. They seem like good models when we learn about them. There's a question here, Sam, uh, Seth, sorry, about uh, agreeing priority for follow ups and monitoring delivery of action plans for regular review. And you've put suggest quarterly six or monthly review, six, quarterly or six monthly review. Is the, has the members of the commission got any thoughts about that? Yeah, Sam, Sam Naylor, um, I think you, I've got the slides now from um, what you sent me yesterday, Steph. So I, I take it we're looking at um, slide five. five now. Yeah. Slide five, yeah, yeah. I mean, my view is we should, if we can, I know it's not like a neighbourhood plan, but we, it should be like a, you know, a neighbourhood plan is a document that uh, we're agreed to and that we're going to refer to in the yeah. future. Does that yeah. make sense? It does, yeah. That's, I, I want some kind of, you know, document that we can keep referring back to, that we can see, you know, that, that can be updated and that, um, you, you know, that's a fluid document that manages our our action on supporting high streets in different localities that we can all refer back to and we can consider. And if now, Sam Dixon, you've got your hand up. I have, yeah. Um, can, I, can I just say that I think the work that we've done has been um, really thorough and um, and and really interesting. However, things are changing very quickly mm -hmm. at the moment right now. I mean, emails that I'm getting from businesses this week suggest that there's been a real shift. So it might not be impacting the same on, on the east of the borough, but certainly on the west of the borough in terms of footfall and confidence and optimism and issues around furlough so I think it's really essential that what we come out with uh, I agree with you completely Richard that what we come out with at the end of this is actually a toolkit a mm -hmm. bespoke toolkit for each of our areas yep. so that you know week by week we could test that you know or, or whoever is charged with delivering this toolkit that they can test that each of these these sort of recommendations and focus that the foci, I suppose the word is plural of focuses, um, is uh, is actually being applied because it, it's it's getting really quite serious now. I agree with you, Sam. And what I could understand this morning, I had a bid bid board meeting, and uh, I mean, like you, I go out onto my patch very often, frequently. And they were saying that uh, footfall in Northwich is back to 92% of what it was before COVID struck. Now, where are they getting those figures from? Because that doesn't bear any kind of resemblance to reality when I'm walking about. It's, it's not like that in Chester now. But anyway, uh, I mean, you know, there's no Welsh people for a start, but yeah. Steph, I don't want to derail your presentation. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we go on to the next slide. Yeah. Okay, that's great. I mean, I think that's that's really interesting feedback, and I think you know one of the things that that we we'll need to address through the report is making sure that any plans are resourced and are prioritised from a council perspective, and you know that that's may, maybe not for the for this call, but it's thinking about how how we do that going forward and, and making sure that we are able to deliver what we say we'll deliver and I think going to cabinet and getting it endorsed will will really help with that um but I think operationally as well as as officers we we, we need that support sure. if I, if I, sorry I was just going to add is I think what would be helpful also is so we can understand um what existing structures there are there in each locality each town and city centre that we're talking to because uh, I'm very much to the ground that we need to be flexible on this and the world is changing at quite a, a rapid pace but my gut feel is that it needs to be whoever is tasked with this and my my, my gut feel had always been that it would be the the regeneration boards or whatever they whatever they're called now is that that would be the best place for it that they have these 25 or whatever um 
issues bits to pop out for and that they can work out locally which ones are of relevance to them and what priority they take but I think it's important to know what structures there are on the ground because I must admit when I was reading through this it does refer to high street task force yeah, and if, that's, if that is to do with effectively the government funding so that's Winslet and Ellesmere Port that's that's sorted or isn't again so that's that's I was trying to understand what structures are there for me it's the uh, 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 it's the high street cells that we've got in operation that are responding to different elements of covid so are they which i think they though there are already partnership groups that are set up with bids and everything else that have been managing the remobilization of high streets and i think they're a good vehicle and i think the regeneration boards should be concentrating on some of the longer term objectives that we come out with and then the high street type cell type structures that have come out of COVID could possibly deal with some of the day to day immediate stuff. What you think, Steph? I mean, your officer that's charged with this. So I think in, in terms of the, que the question, the fishbone analysis will take you through the different areas that require support and attention. And I think the, the example that we've got on, on the screen that talks about an, an area that the governance isn't really in, in place. So if you look at somewhere like Northwich, the bids have got a clear role, the town council have got a real a real role, and it's there's quite a lot of capacity within within that that area. I suppose what, what this area is showing is that the, there aren't those type of organizations there. So the fishbone analysis will will really point our attention to to what needs um, that support okay. and then through that process we'll be able to identify a, a governance structure that's appropriate for that for that area if that makes sense yeah no that's that makes perfect sense that's brilliant okay excuse me is it you that's doing it then steph who's doing the analysis who's doing the I think we, and that and that's that's what that's what we'll be doing if one of the one of the round if you support one of the recommendations is doing the analysis that that's one of the first pieces of work that we'll have to do and um, so it, it's likely to be something that's done between regeneration localities the different boards that are in place so whether it's a bid or you know a town council and um, thinking about some of our more rural high streets who who who's there is it a retail organization um, so there'll be different structures for different areas, if that makes sense. Yes, but what will be the time scale on that then? So it goes to cabinet. If this report goes to cabinet at the end of March. Yes. Uh, sorry, end of November. <laughs> and um, I would say that we would want to see these plans coming back within a couple of months. Steph, is that possible? Yeah, I think I think it. You know, this work won't won't be done before the cabinet report. Um, I think it's something that will potentially take, you know, a, it's a, if it's a desk exercise or a face to face exercise, um, but it's about having the, the priority and the emphasis to be able to do that. OK. OK. Any other questions? Rich, um, I, I yeah. was just going to say, can, can we, I mean, if you go back to the previous slide, it was about, you know, are we happy to accept the recommendation that it's, yeah. you know, the regular review? So I think if we get if we go through the recommendations that Steph's come forward and at the end then discuss about, I mean, the governance, what is it? The expression um, form follows function and not the other way around. I think we're all, I can see lots of people nodding at that. Yeah, I think, um, yes, that's fine. I think my... I, I understand what Steph's saying that we, we need, it will have to be a unique set of uh, there's a unique set of circumstances in each area and as this emerges from this we will figure out what we need to do and I think that's what you're saying as well Sam. Yes. Okay, evidence session one, which was the um, data and user groups perspectives. Um, people from the university and youth clubs and and everything else came. Oh, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Uh, fire away, Steph. OK, so if we just move on to the next slide, please, Beth. So I think the key themes that came out of that session was the real mix of roles in those town centres. And I think we saw some trends about retail being in decline um, and really thinking of our town, city, town and city centres and high streets as not just a place for retail, but thinking about um, it as, as an experience that appealed to everybody in our communities. Um, thinking about opportunities around vacant shops. So I think we'd identified it as 
the decline in retail happening, there would be lots of empty shops and really thinking about how we can be innovative in bringing some of those empty shops forward for different uses. Um, then thinking about residential back in town centre areas, whether we would look at conversions of some of the retail, um, living over the shops type schemes, or whether our regeneration plans should be looking at more residential within those town centre areas. I think it was about communal and open space, um, really picking up on the, the themes around community and young people and old, older people. Um, so not every um, square metre of our, so looking at our regen schemes, they wouldn't actually generate revenue, um, but it would support some of our wellbeing um, priorities. And I think when we look at our borough cultural strategy um, and the place plan, that really picks up on that already. Um, I think it was about bringing creativity to life. And I think this was quite brought forward by um, Emma Stringfellow from Action Transport Theatre. They've done some amazing work in Ellesmere Port over the pandemic, really using some of those spaces, um, bringing art to life um, and thinking about how we could support some of those businesses as well, whether it be low rents or shorter turnover um, of leases, those, those type of things. I think one of the other things that came out and particularly over the pandemic was about how we were able to connect our town centres better to the areas, maybe not just with cars or public transport, but really about those walking and cycling networks. And I think, again, reflecting on some of the positives of the pandemic, people have started to discover their local areas and they've started to find those cycle routes. They've started to walk those areas more. So I think it's it's really how we how we make, make the most of that. Um, thinking about some of the opportunities for greening areas of our town centres. And I think that also talks to our climate change plan as well um, and works with our colleagues in Mersey Forest, um, thinking about opportunities to bring green into town centres and having that, that breakaway space for, for people there. Um, I think one of the other issues, one of the other opportunities is about heritage and our arts asset so I think if you look at the cine window that's been delivered in Winsford um, there's also the sub subway projects where we've put um, art in there and some of that performing arts that's been able to happen during the, the pandemic as well it's about really harnessing that and making it happen in the future as well not 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 just um, as a result of the pandemic um, and I think what we've really seen is that there, there are pockets of, you know, real excellence where we've um, engaged our local communities and those organisations and the stakeholders to deliver for themselves and to create those opportunities for themselves. Um, and, you know, it's not for us to stand in the way, it's for us to, to facilitate and, and support that really. So I think they, they, they were the, thing, the themes that came out of the evidence. Um, and then I think in terms of the recommendations, I think it was about looking at all of the data for the area. So there's a data theme here again and looking at a consistent approach. So it will be a different approach in each area that was suitable for them, but it will be a consistent approach acro across the borough. Um, do you want to take a question now or do you do we come back? I, I just on yeah, the, the date. Sorry. Sorry, Richard. Um, on the data, I think one of the one of the recommendations needs to be around starting a conversation with with property owners, um, because if we're going to if we're going to have these different uses and and sort of different encourage different uses. So, for example, you know, a landlord, a, a business owner has come to not a business owner a landlord of businesses has come to me and asked for help and your team's been really helpful with that. But it's like, if we're going to make this part of the toolkit, then we need to charge whoever is given the toolkit to deliver, you know, tell them to get on with that conversation. Well, I thought that was further down. We were setting up a landlord's um, forum. forum. Oh, yeah. So, Sorry. Yeah. It's not here. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> It's all right. Shut up now. Because <laughs> yeah. that's uh, one of the things we identified that we needed a landlord's forum to take those discussions forward for different changes of use. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I think getting together um, agents and stuff like that to talk about high streets and to, to kind of talk about opportunities and what we're trying to deliver. There may be some, um, some some landlords that want to get involved in that and join some kind of scheme or something to, collectively that would allow us to be able to use buildings that they've got on their books that have been empty for a while but it's 
we have to, like you right like we've been saying we have to have this forum or some kind of what mechanism for being able to contact them um and uh, if that is one of the things that comes out of this then i think that'll be a good step in the right direction uh charles you've got your hand up i think sam i think sam naylor was first actually sorry sam naylor oh that's very that's very kind of you charles uh, yeah on this slide or and when i read them last night i couldn't see anywhere the the uh, the actual words because I think it was stressed quite a few times throughout the uh, exercise that we completed, is that we've got to utilise our natural and historic assets to the full, and you know where I'm coming from with with, with the river, you know yes. we've got to utilise that. So it needs stating somewhere that we we really need to utilise our kind of natural and historic assets. It's in the key themes on the on slide eight, but it's not in the uh, it's not in the recommendations. So can, can we just make sure that get carried carried over, Steph? Yeah, I will do. The, we'll the greening of the town and the use of heritage and uh, natural assets. Na natural assets, I suppose, would, would be the thing. Think Sam's talking about. Charles, yeah. you've got your hand up. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I mean, it was just. I mean, I I ran off the agendas and scribbled on them during the meeting so I, I pulled off the my handwritten notes that I took at the time and one of the things in this particular sessions there was a common theme that came that came up and that was the the, the concept of accessibility and clearly that was something that the um uh, that Cornell from uh the disabled access forum he he was uh, talking about but it was it was a common theme amongst various issues there be that on the um age or the income or, or or disability or what have you it was how accessible the the town and city centers are so i do think that the that the, there's a there's a way of phrasing that i haven't quite got it right in my head but it, it it's it's accessibility for you know all for, in general and also and also in specific for, for for different groups i think that does need to be um mentioned within there and also i think one of the things that they were the talking about is that sometimes when they're referring to community uses that i i think that if one's going to refer if you're going to talk about a range of uses then probably leisure is also another good word to use as well as community because certainly from a uh, a commercial landlord's perspective um, a community use is sounds less appealing than a leisure use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, you know, from my, my view is you've got commercial uses, uh, specifically being retail, leisure, and also sort of business related uses. And obviously, you've got in the wider community sphere. So I think those would be, they are sort of mentioned, but within those recommendations, there isn't really that reference of wider uses. Which I know was part of the discussion. Then. We will pick up on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think we should add those. I agree yeah. with that. Mm. Um, any other comments on on this section, or should we move on to the funding and development um, set so the next session, which was session two? Um, so that one was with um, Louise Davis from Liverpool Foundation Homes, Kate Howe, Jonathan Fell, Alistair Chapman, and Tom Prescott. OK, that's brilliant. So this one had a theme around um, placemaking. I think everybody really emphasised the importance of placemaking um, and making people want to be there as well, not just having to go there to do something. So making it much more of an experience than just a, a, a functional place that you, that you go and do stuff in. Um, thinking about some innovative partnerships that, that we may already have that I think Kate Howe talked about around delivering the greatest benefits. So maybe working more in partnership with some of our housing associations um, or with some of the existing funding structures that, that we have within, within the area through the Build and Thrive partnership. Um, I think one of the challenges um, were around how we stimulate aspiration for home ownership. Um, thinking about large number of private rented areas, thinking about what um, I think there was some feedback around student accommodation as well, and really making sure that we're able to think about the different types of, of homeowners or people who want to be on that home ownership ladder. So maybe a, a shared ownership type product. Um, I think quality came up as well around homes and um, thinking about 
as well as our carbon reduction com commitment and some of those space standards, particularly now that a lot more people are going to be working from home, thinking about how potentially we would have to change some of those home designs um, and thinking about on the smaller properties, being having more of that live workspace available. Um, I think other places have done it quite successfully. I think it's it's never really been that big a thing nationally. I think it, it will be now as more, more people will go to remote working. Um, and then I think really looking at the different models of ownership in town centres. So I think we have seen a real change in the way town centres are owned. I think there's a lot more local authorities who are engaging in those areas, as well as the private sector. As we move away from just pure retail, the, the, there are some great stakeholders who, who've done real leisure type destinations as well. Um, I think one of the key things that came out was about engaging private funding and um, thinking about how we can work in partnership with some of those developers or some of those owners of existing shopping centres um, to deliver true regeneration. Uh, and I think whilst we're doing that, there's a there's a real you look at, you know, the government agenda about build back better um, and, and, and some of that. It's thinking about the external funding initiatives that will be coming forward um, and really being ready to bid or having some of those oven ready schemes as the market develops um, and another key role within that will be the local enterprise partnerships so thinking about how they direct their feasibility funding and longer term how they can influence things like the future high street fund um, and the comprehensive spending review so I think those th those were the themes from the feedback um, and then I think we moved on to bring about some of the um, recommendations we've got a hand up, so I'll just pause for a moment. Is that me? Yeah, far away. Yeah. Yeah. OK, um, one of the things I've been thinking about, and um, we've just spoke about it, you know, because of what's happened, people need more, we'll just say, working space within their homes. But for those people who are already living in homes and haven't got the chance to move, shall we say, to, to access that type of space, some of the shops could be considered for um, I'm going to say digital centres where people could come to work and, you know, come and go, come and go and have the, you know, um, uh, a chance to see and speak with other people. Now, I know that's difficult at the moment under the pandemic because you can't go within two metres, but it is worth thinking about that you can't we've got loads of space at the moment the shops are closing like mad so is there is there opportunity to offer space like that for those folk who haven't got the opportunity within their homes or likely to have okay so you've almost read the next recommendation lynn so i'm, <laughs> I'm really i'm really grateful for that so i think from a from a specification perspective we don't we'd obviously look to explore some of those live work options within a, any future housing offer and then i think you know maybe the work the words are slightly different but you know review co-working flexible office and business startup incubation space yes. and that's thinking about that real collaborative side of things and picking up on some of the isolation issues really about working from home and people having the opportunity to work in a space that's suitable but they're also able to interact with others so yeah. the em empty shop suggestions are a, a fantastic one um, and you know we, we will be exploring that in, in in the future and then I think also thinking about living over the shops and bringing upper retail floors back into use so whilst you know the the town centres are great some of the the properties could be quite land hungry and we really want to make sure that there's that ground floor animation and that ground floor use so that could be living over existing shops or maybe thinking about how we build that into any any new new schemes I think that's really good particularly northwich and chester i think there's a lot of space above shops there's that lots. could be could yeah. be used for housing and it would you know really help town centres if there's a lot more people living in them so i think there, there's definitely some work to do there charles you've got your yeah i mean just looking at my little handwritten scroll from that particular hearing i'd written down uh, i think some of these are are covered i'd written um four main points which was um co-working flexible retail tenancy turnover rents and council ownership i'd also made a point which may be to do with funding whereas i've gone and said um, public works loan board for regeneration um, so that is a, a, a as a query and then in relation to I think more 
um, sort of commercial uses, I've gone and put three things where I've gone and said the obviously the new use classes, which I think is covered in the next bit in relation to the E class. Um, I, I sort of said for for uh, you know commercial use when you're looking at it, are you looking at a more local use as opposed to a national or a retail or a regional covenant strength? That becomes important both for private landlords but also for the council where it's looking at its own developments. And again, I think with pop-up units, I've just gone and written down the word flexibility. Could I just come back on that as well? One of the things with um, communal working space, um, obviously you can't provide it for nothing. There would be a charge. But if firms are expecting people to work from home more and people want to do that, then they, they uh, with the hub and spoke model, that would pay for people to go in there and do you know so many hours a half a day or whatever it is they need to for their social and mental um strengths you know to work like that alongside other people okay you, you can certainly imagine a situation where an operator creates lots and lots of flexible working space and then companies mm. pay for subscriptions for staff and you can move around these different yes. places in different towns and use facilities like you would do with a gym or whatever you can certainly imagine that happening yeah. uh, councillor dixon you had your hand up yeah thanks um as a practical very quick recommendation steph our reg services teams can already advise people about how to make their their workspace covid safe and actually that's what the high street recovery teams are, are doing and what the erdf high street information officers are doing um so in a sense um one of the recommendations should be that we we should sort of up that so that you know if as Lynn, Lynn's made the point that you know shops are falling vacant pretty fast now and it could be turned around very quickly if they've got access to the right advice and I think maybe one of our recommendations is is an, a you know an advisory a dedicated advisory service using the ERDF funding to actually advise landlords of vacant properties how to get it into a covid safe flexible working space that's a good, really interesting idea that's good okay um the, uh, the the bit that i took away from that because i always bang on about these things is, is pop-up shops and finding a mechanism for the council or a little body bids or whatever to be able to bring landlords into some kind of scheme um, that would allow for flexible use of their space. I, I think that, you know, I would really like to see that very prominently as a recommendation. Um, I think Charles covered it slightly in what he said as well, but if we could make sure it's more, much more prominent, that means I'll, I'll be a happy man. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Just, just to assure members, you know, we have we have been working um, with different departments across the council on, on looking at our own estate and thinking about how we could use some of those shops in a more innovative way. Um, and I think there's a there's a real advantage at the moment from a small business perspective that those small businesses taking any vacant units will have um, have a rate free period until the end of March at the moment. Um, so that could be a win win for us where potentially we've got empty shop units that we own um, and it could bring some vi vitality back. So we are we are working on it. We've not got the answers yet. So we haven't waited for that recommendation. We have kind of got on and done with it, to be honest. That's great. Could, great. could we also think about branding if we're going down this route, what we've just suggested, uh, a branding so that people know, oh, that's one of those flexible working spaces. Are you with me? A branding and a colour coordination so that any shops that are turned into that kind of thing would you would immediately know. You like you walk round, you see a car phone warehouse and you know that you're going by a phone there, don't you? You know what I mean? So it's a branding for this type of delivery that would be the same across any high street. In Cheshire West. Re yes. recognized a recognized um our lovely bubbles that are yeah. in the slides <laughs> yeah yeah there's yeah. that many connotations with bubbles at the moment honestly i give up <laughs> <laughs> i like yeah no I, like I don't that. want yeah. bubbles on it <laughs> <laughs> um okay uh, has anybody got any other points to make just about that that um kind of funding and uh, development uh session that we that we had nope okay um 
you want to move on to the next one then? Carl Critchlow, the bids, and John Adlin from the uh, Cheshire and Warrington Local Enterprise Bank. You can read them out, Steph. But, um, yeah. so, so we had some... Just before you start on that, I just, yeah. something just came in my head then when you yeah, mentioned yeah, funding. Um, shouldn't we, if we are going down that route and we, we're looking at ways to do it, we, sh we need to come up with a funding model, you know, so that that can be um, publicised to whether it's individuals or whether it's companies, you know, uh, like we were saying before. Some, you, mm. I was reading something about Trafford. Um, they had some kind of like loans available for people to be able to bring spaces back into use. I don't know whether that, that was. Mm. It, it was, no, that I, was think, I was thinking that not to, to do actually do it, but for people to buy the space, you know, I want to go in for half a day, so it's going to cost me five quid. You know, mm. I don't know. It, it something along those lines. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I thought you were talking about how they, how these places would get uh, would come would come about. But yeah, I see what you mean. Okay, thanks. I mean a funding model around it, you know, for companies and individuals. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Steph, do you, do you want to move on to the next section? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So we took some perspective from the bid. So we had Chester and Northwich bid, Carl and Jane, and um, then we had Coffee House, who are a regional independent. Um, coffee provider and like cafe uh, we had John Adlin who is the property director investment director from the left um, we had Heather who is from Cushman and Wakefield one of the leading um, surveyors in, in in the UK and then we had Karen Bates who was from our marketing uh, markets team not marketing um, and I think there were, there were quite a lot of themes on this one um, so I think although we saw footfall decline and um, some tourist and visitor demand had maintained on on some of those areas but picking up on on what Sam said I think some of those visitor um, footfalls are extremely sensitive to local lockdowns. Um, independent businesses would potentially need more business support um, to manage some of the day-to-day -day issues and actually engage with projects. And I suppose that picks up on the theme that, that both Councillor Dixon and Councillor Gibbon made, made then about, you know, really offering that proactively um, to the businesses, which I think, to be honest, our reg services guys have been really interactive in a positive way with the businesses throughout throughout the pandemic. Um, I don't think we could have asked them to do any more, really. They've given out lots of advice. You know, any enforcement has been the, at, at the last resort. Um, again, it picked up on empty uses, about collaborative engagement with landlords and agents working together, thinking about how we can use the bids and other organisations to help us with that. We have had some some challenges with landlords in the past, not engaging or some of the properties being part of a portfolio investment. So some of the landlords aren't, aren't really interested in individual shops um, Then thinking about how our local authorities can support by investing in, in problem units. And I think that, that then goes back to what you said, Councillor Beecham, around grants or think about how we've worked in Barron's Key about fitting some of the units out for businesses to move into. Um, so I think that and that was the feedback that came through from Coffee House his experience in in another area um of the northwest sorry i've got all things pop, popping up on my screen at the moment um i think the the trends that we'd seen um particularly on the financial market through through covid was looking at um bricks and mortar retail to on online um and home working again and then also reduction in office footprints um so i think heather had outlined a lot of disinvestment from the office places so it's about thinking about how that will influence our, our future strategies um, and thinking about the types of investors we, we would want to get in um, and really thinking about the shift to sustainability and, uh, and work-life balance so a lot of people who we've spoken to in in the industrial areas as well as the town centres have really taken an opportunity to um, ditch the car ride to work they've felt a lot more headspace when when, when they're able to get out and uh, enjoy some of those natural areas um and i think it's really given people an opportunity to take stock um unless you work in a local authority um there's been an increase in flexible workspaces um and we, we'll expect to see smaller hubs coming forward with lots of co-working spaces and i think it's the trend that we've maybe seen in london and manchester and some of those other areas where you've got um real hubs of, of places to work um so it's thinking about how that could uh translate in into our own areas um as we see businesses and 
and people not wanting to commute to those big cities because they either don't feel safe or they, they've realised that they're now able to work from home or work more re, re, remotely. Um, I think people do want to live more closer to the workplaces um, and in a stimulating environment, um, thinking about some of those communities. I think we also talked about some flexibility for traders, and I think that linked back to some of the market side of things to help them be able to change um, and, and evolve um, and thinking about how partnerships with the local authority, our markets teams and other traders are, are really important. I think we've seen some good examples of this in Northwich with the artisan market um, and also hopefully in the leads up to Christmas, we will see that in, in, the, in the Christmas market as well with our existing market. Um, I think one of the key things that came out and, you know, we have touched on it here as well, long leases with really um, onerous break clauses are really unappealing. And that's to market traders and also to smaller retailers. Um, they may want to move into high street units. They may want to grow their business from a market stall into a, a shop unit. Um, but the, the, the lease is quite onerous for them. So it's thinking about how we can be a bit more innovative in that as a local authority, but also influence some of those other landlords to, to follow suit. So I think if we can just pick up on the recommendations. So I think one of them was about really understanding the current landlord picture in areas and whether we need landlords forums or areas where we are the landlord, thinking about how we can um, demonstrate best practice and maybe be a little bit more flexible. I'll just pause there. Oh, you got your hand up. Yeah, it was just um, it was just in relation to the landlord issue in the uh, I, in that I did um, have a brief conversation with Caroline Thomas outside of the commission, um, sort of following this point on from here. She 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 contacted me, and the the the, the idea that I gave back to her was that. For commercial landlords, especially in the run up to Christmas, often we you get inquiries in relation, often it's market traders who want to go and take a shop for two months. And for a lot of commercial landlords, it's more trouble than it's worth in relation to the legal costs of sorting stuff out. And also the potential risk that you might let somebody have the unit for a month or two, and then either um, you, you know, there's some difficulty with it, or alternatively, uh, you might not be able to, to to move them out if by some miracle um, a proper tenant came along. And what my suggestion had been with, with Caroline when we, were, when we were chatting about it was that actually, if it was the council that took a license document, a standard license document, which the council could have, for most commercial landlords, even if it was at a relatively um, low figure, that would be likely to appeal to them as long and from the council's point of view that the council would then be able to let you know market traders you know you, you do the you, you do the legal documents so that effectively market traders could occupy the premises but as far as the commercial landlord was concerned the person the the, the body legally responsible for the unit would be the council and in that respect, you've got a common legal document. It's something that can be move, used quite quickly. And it deals with the issue from the commercial landlord's point of view over the, the concern of, of a short term letting to um, a financially very, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm trying to go and do it is that is, is that you don't have somebody who's on the hook if it goes wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, and so I, I know she was going to go back to the other officers to discuss that because she didn't have any, um, uh, you know, authority to, to to discuss it, and neither did I. But we were just having a conversation about it as a potential way of dealing with that. Because what she indicated to me was I was sort of saying, well, why on earth don't we just do that in Weaver Square? And I think the issue there had been that um, there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done that's to existing units mm -hmm. and that's what causes the problem in terms of yes you've got empty units in Weaver Square but the council needs to spend quite a bit of money on it and it doesn't make any sense to do that for short term so letting. My, my, I mean if, the, this theme for me is, is probably the most fundamental thing in the uh, in everything that we've learned because if we cannot find a vehicle in which to bring together 
different landowners, different agents and everything else into a way which everybody feels like they're going to get something out of it that doesn't devalue properties for, for people who've stacked their investments in other ways. And it's easier for them to leave it empty than it is to devalue it by reducing rents and everything else. These are all of the real issues that we face on the high street. So if we cannot find a vehicle that allows uh, the council with its properties and, and private uh, landlords with theirs to come in and, and then for somebody to be able to manage those in a, in, a, in a way which you've just described, Charles, that allows people to come in and pay um, a set fee to use them for a period of time. Maybe it's two weeks, maybe it's a month, whatever it is, where they can understand how much they're going to pay in in, um, in rent and in bills and in, and in everything else. And they have to leave that property in the way that they found it when they leave. Um, but they can build that into their business model. So if you're a cheese farmer from Cheshire, Chester or Northwich or whatever for four weeks and sell all of your cheese in a pop-up type interesting environment that's great for the high street because it means something new's arrived um, for, for bigger retailers it will drive footfall but for the people who are doing that the landlords and everything they they need some degree of uh, comfort that they're going to get paid and everything and it has for me it has to be either some kind of cooperative or some kind of um, legal structure uh, collaboration of some description, a partnership of some description that allows everybody to become part of this and for those properties to be marketed as opportunities for some people might want to go on tour with them. So the cheese farmer might want to do a four weeks in Northwich, four weeks in Chester, and that might be all he does that year and he goes off and makes a load of cheese for the rest of the year. Whatever it's going to be, we need to create the ability to be able to do that on our high streets across Cheshire West. And the vehicle for doing that is the most interesting question for me. And with this theme and these points that have been made in these two slides, I think if we can crack this, we can do something really, really innovative. Sam, you got your hand up. I was just going to say we can't. I don't think it's appropriate for us to, to step into the place where these commercial negotiations are thrashed out. However, we can facilitate that conversation happening. And there are a lot of people that we know that landlords don't know and vice versa. You know, that that it's about providing the place where everybody can come to. I, I, I don't think as a recommendation we can we can actually get into that space of those negotiations between landlord and tenant unless we are the landlord but we can still facilitate it because I think I think the consequences I mean Charles will know this better than anyone because it's his, his day to day sort of business but you know if we recommend that that's what we're going to do then we have to have the best legal advice the best commercial advice and I don't think we have the capacity to do no, I, I think I might be being I might be being misunderstood. What I'm trying to say is that, in essence, what I'm suggesting is is the way that you do it is that that the council is taking a short term tenancy of a shop, yeah, which it is then allowed to sublet, for want of a better phrase. Now, that, legally, those are the wrong words to use, but that is that is effectively what it. So the, the, the longer term solution might be that whilst uh, a market trader or a new business had been in there for two or three months, it's at that point that the council might then say to the landlord, look, this, this be, they've been trading really well there. We're only, gonna, we're only doing this for three months. If you want to carry on, it's at that point that they chat to each other. So what I'm suggesting is, is that initial letting, if it was a brand new um, business that somebody has got that they're running out of their house and that somebody comes to me or commercial landlords and said, oh, I'd like to go and take a lease of the property for two months to see whether or not it'll work. Even in the current market, most landlords are unlikely to say yes. Whereas if the council came along and said, look, this is what we're doing. This is our standard document. And for want of a better phrase, you're, you're, you're dealing with it the way that you would deal with a market trader who was going to go and take a, 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 a license to occupy that that is the way that it does, because from the commercial landlord's point of view, that they are dealing with the council and that they are not dealing with the with the independent retailer who's going to be occupying. It would only be if after, you know, on this particular property, it works really well and that the independent occupier says, 
actually, I've worked really well. I'd like to go and take a, a six month, a 12 month, a, a two year deal here. Brilliant. The council at that point can then say to the landlord, we've got a tenant for you. The, the problem with that model, though, Charles, is that means that the council has to take all of the risk. And I don't think that's fair. It has to. It's got to be. Yeah. It, I, get, I get what you're saying. I, I agree with you that we have to have some kind of vehicle, but the risk can't be with the council. So I, I think. If, well, if, as Steph was saying, we're already looking at ways that we can do this with our own property, and if we can build a model and demonstrate it to commercial operators that's working, then I think they should be coming in with us. They should be putting their properties forward to be part of the same scheme. Uh, and we have to find a way to share out profits. Or I, I, think, I, think that, I, think, I think they would. And the way that you do it is that you agree in advance how it's going to work and that you would say to the commercial commercial landlords look you know this is what we're this is what we're doing this is what the basic this is the basis of what it would be i mean yeah. i'm just looking now um uh, you know i keep re uh, retailers requirements uh, <coughs> keep them for years and there was a company called hawkins bazaar which i don't know if you re recall and that does every <laughs> year i haven't seen it this year sadly and i don't think i saw it last year but they would send a requirement round in august september for effectively for a two month let and that because it was Hawkins Bazaar and they were relatively well known and they had their own tenancy schedule document and you knew that they weren't going to be in there for two months, most landlords would recognise that. And, you know, I would then speak to my commercial landlords around this time of year and go, we're going to get some Christmas inquiries in. Uh, are you interested in it? And nine out of 10 of them would come back and say, well, if it's a Hawkins Bazaar or, or Bazaar or something similar to that, yes, I'm interested. If it's a market trader, then I'm not. Right. Okay. And 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 that's what I'm trying to cross the bridge with you. And uh, you know, if the that's council good. was doing it, the council. I'm not suggesting that effectively the council does this at, z at zero risk to itself because there would be there would be an element of profit rent that would be going on there because it may well be the commercial landlord is happy to look at this that it's going to acknowledge that you're going to be taking as the council's going to be taking most of the risk that effectively whatever license fee. That the um, that the the trader is paying the council is not going to be the same as what the council is paying the landlord, and it would only take effect when you've got somebody ready to sign the license document. Okay. So no, so nobody pays anything until there's somebody ready to walk in. And that's I mean it, for us to work this one out as a recommendation in higher detail. There's no way we can do that, but I do think we can do it as a recommendation as a as how this could be done yeah i agree it's what model could we use to look at how we use flexible how we can facilitate the use of flexible space inside our sit town yeah. centers i think is, is a perfect recommendation the, the, the um, correct and the correct lease legal term i think is not is is an occupancy license okay it's it's an occupancy license and and legally that's very important because a license is different to a lease in legal terms and that make that that makes a very that that's very important commercial landlords. Okay, and it's what who we can work with as well. You know, there might be other people that have come and been in in our uh, um, involved in our you know involved in this commission. You know. Um, housing associations and other organizations in in various different places that might suddenly decide that they can use some of these flexible spaces in this way for some of the things that they're doing as well so i think this this is great i mean i honestly think this is the, one of the fundamental things if we can figure out how to do this it would be brilliant sam dixon you've got your hand up and then sam naylor yeah i i'm i'm not sure i i, I would i would really need to know a lot more about what charles is recommending there because I, a that you know the capacity of the council to do that i can i can see the council acting as a matchmaker if you like for um property owners and you know we have access to funding that could be sweeteners for you know access to you know information government money but i you know at the back of my head i've got you know government saying councils are investing too heavily in the private sector property market you know i mean they did that massive report um i can't remember when it came out you know criticizing councils and I, I know it was about sort of great big um buying you know uh, estates that weren't even in their their own borough um as a, as a sort of way of generating income but i i, I just have to i'd have to think a lot more about that one um, and you know 
where would we build the capacity for that from? How would we go about it? It's a whole different piece of work, I think. It, it is. I, I think it's about uh, the council using some of its own properties to demonstrate how this would work and then looking for partnerships with bids and everything else to manage an expansion. Oh, yeah, with, with, with our own yeah. our own land. Yeah, yeah. I think we demonstrate how it works and then look at ways that we can start to bring other properties in if you know if if and if and when it's working that, that's my preferred method but i think the recommendation to review ways in which we can flexibly use space on the high street and the role that the council can play in that is is a is a really good recommendation because i i honestly believe this is the crux of it if we can't find a way to to match people as you've in the words that you described between people that want space flexibly and people who've got space but don't want to deal with it flexibly we're not going to get anywhere so we have to find a way to resolve those two things otherwise we're still going to be having the same conversation about shops closing and everything else uh, you know in years to come we're not going to get anywhere so Sammy Naylor yeah thanks Rich I've actually been saying this for well over two years now we need a kind of first stop approach if somebody wants to open a business in Northwich okay you, we we own Weaver Square we we own Barron's Key but we have little control over the high street my idea, which, as I say, I've been I've been su suggesting it for a long time now, is we, we have this kind of one first first stop approach, a, a facilitator who says, yeah, you want to open a business, be it a micro brewery or whatever. And, and they kind of, uh, you know, facilitate it using the both uh, the private sector and the, the estate that we own in terms of um, Weaver Square and Barron's Key. Um, it's it's just common sense to me. So as I say, you're a facilitator for new business. Come come to Northwich, we're the council. We'll try and help you. We'll try and help you. We'll try and make it happen. And um, we we kind of negotiate them with the private sector and with the the, the the property that we own. That's what I think anyway. Been saying it for ages. Mm. You there, Lynn? Oh, it's a doll frozen, sorry. <laughs> um, if Sam will remember, when Barron's Key was empty, I, I suggested at the time that they could bring in shops in, in the interim period, and one of them was the, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's that great big, um, oh, they set up Christmas shops. They did one in um, Liverpool One, absolutely fantastic. We haven't got the facilities to um, facilitate anything like that. And it's a shame. And I think something should be f set up where somebody can go to somebody, A, in each of the main towns and say exactly that, that they want to do a short term interim let in empty property A. And especially when it's the councils, you know, that should be able to be set up pretty quickly. But we've not looked at it. I think I, th I think that's the work that Steph's referring to now. I mean, she can come in if you want to, Steph. But I think that is what's actually happening th at the moment. Um, you know, as a result of these conversations that we've been having, I think that that has already started. And some of the ideas for Chester Christmas this year have been around how the market can be used, uh, how the what would have been a Christmas market instead can be used in in flexible spaces in in shops that aren't currently empty. Is that is that right, Steph? Yes, it is. And I think, you know, we've looked at the forum and we've looked at um, Winsford, Winsford Cross as well. I think I, I can't comment on what's happened in, in Barron's Key. I do think some of those units aren't necessarily fitted out for anybody to use. So that's potentially what's been the barrier. Um, whereas some of the older units are already maybe suitable for somebody to move in on a more shorter period. Um, but I think because Barron's Key is, is a new development, Quite a lot of them haven't got floor coverings and things, so I think from a from a hazardous perspective, I, I don't think we'd be able to let them out in that in that state. Um, but some of the others have an opportunity to do that. Brilliant. Okay. Can I uh, just come in, Rich? Yeah, because yeah, I think I think actually, if you think about Ellesmere Port, that that is where this is relevant because. Yeah. We don't have a great deal of council ownership of the retail units that are there that are falling empty. So 
uh, you know, and I'm I'm talking myself into it now, but <laughs> um, how are we going to enable you know, exactly. emerging we have, businesses to, yeah. We have we to find a vehicle. We have got the process. Well, that's it. We have to, we, I think the key recommendation is that we have to find a way that we could, we, we have to start small and build, to demonstrate that we can do something and that there's a demand for it. And then we have to try and bring property owners in with us. And if they can come into it in a way which doesn't devalue their, um, the property, if they've stacked other investments against the value of the rental, perceived rental income on their books, you know, they're not going to want to drop their rent or give them away for community use or, or whatever, because it, it devalues their property. But we can find a way to bring them into some kind of scheme where they still get some degree of income, um, which supports our high street and everything. If we can figure out that, we'll be we'll be, we'll be doing something amazing, I think. So it's a good recommendation. I, th I honestly think this is the crux of everything that we've been learned about. Everything else feeds off this um, um, this kind of work, bringing innovative and interesting flexible stuff onto high streets is the way that you can be out of town big uh, um, space in my opinion so great uh, is there any other comments on on this particular section oh Charles you've got your hand up sorry me again uh, just on that particular point with the more I've just been thinking it's going around is effectively what it requires is is there's there's potentially two documents there's one document which is the document between the council and the occupier which is effectively a license to occupy which the council may well already have in terms of short-term lettings that it does within its own property so that document potentially already exists and to say that would be a license to occupy the bit above that which would be which would only be required in uh, you know in potentially uh, scenarios where you don't have council owned buildings is an agreement between the landlord and the council yeah and that would make direct reference to that occupier license so that that's the key bit is i reckon that the license to occupy probably already and that the council probably has already got an approved section of that so that would actually fast track that bit and it's then just being in a better position to to know that that can be used more quickly and then as i say it's whether or not you need a a document above that which would be the agreement between the the the, the council and the private landlord that's really useful okay thanks charles is any uh, sam you've got your hand up where yeah, Sandy. I mean, uh, just just following on from this, I mean, clearly this is quite an this this is important, and one of the people that we haven't actually spoken to is um, the head of our own property services, and I think in in retrospect, it would have been useful to have had a session with with our own property team to discuss you know to find out what their current sort of way of working is ask the questions that charles has been asking um explore with them you know what their view of that would be uh what what, what their approach currently is I, I i just wonder it given them what you've just said richard about how you feel that this is this is the sort of the central cog around which everything else um works and and that turns all the other cogs and given that we do have estates property that we we are um, we own maybe we should I, I don't want to hold things up but maybe we should be having a session with our property team well they've just done a property review we've been waiting for it now for over six months it's supposed to be coming to cabinet in it was supposed to be coming in September um, so now it's going to be November, but I've not heard that it's coming, so I don't know what the hold up is. So I've had these conversations with Andrew Playfer about this kind of thing, and they they have um, uh, they are considering like meanwhile uses and flexible uses on some of the properties that we own as part of that property review. So there are, if you like, the, to use the words that you've just used, the cogs of the council are. I suppose they are aligning around these kind of ideas um, anyway, and I think the the work that's being done about Christmas this year feeds into part of that. And I think we are moving, and I think the outcomes of this and a recommendation from the commission will also give weight to to the kind of importance and value we put onto this kind of idea. So I think these things are are happening. Um, so. 
If everybody's happy, should we crack could on? I, could I just make a comment, Councillor? Yeah. Sorry, I know we've we've tried to make the witnesses as outward looking as possible to give us more innovation but just to give you some assurance we are working with property mm. colleagues you know we're not doing this in isolation in any way shape or form you know we are we are working really closely together so i just i just wanted to make to make that point so we we are working really closely with andrew and his, and his team on this to make to make sure we're not you know we're not overstepping the mark in any way or we're, we're aligned and and they're ready for us to come with some challenges for them yeah good um I'm just conscious of time. Is it yeah. sound Richard. nail as you take? You yeah, take all, all I wanted to say, uh, yeah. Richard, is that it's, this will be just an extension of, of, of what we already do. I.e., Sarah, Sarah McVicker, she's got her hands all over Baron's Key. Tony Lazinski's got his hands all over Weaver Square. All, all, all we need is to kind of combine that and say, as a council, let's be the facil facilitator for all businesses who want to come into Northwich, whether it's in Weaver Square, Barons Quay or the High Street, we'll be the facilitator. If we can help, we'll make it happen. Whether it's an extension of our business development team or what, I don't know, but I just see it will be uh, an opportunity for us and I think it will be easier. I go back to when I first kind of started in the police in, in uh, Runcorn and Warrington, and the, the the kind of new buildings were coming on screen. The it was always talk to Irene Bilton. Bilton. <laughs> talk to Irene Bilton. Uh, you know, and so if you wanted if you wanted to do business with with Warrington or with Runcorn, you'd pick up the phone and you'd you'd, you'd speak to this not a person but an organisation. But she, she was she was it was identified as a person. You know, Irene Bilton. You you obviously remember her. I do. It was a fantastic piece of um, work that. <laughs> it did well for Warrington. Mm. So Irene Bilton wasn't a real person, it was? Yeah, she was actually. Oh, but she was a real person. It was an organisation. She fronted it and her name fronted it. It was on the radio, it was in the papers, you name it. Eileen right. Bilton was everywhere. Yeah. Right. I worked in Warrington at the time and it, it was a very good campaign actually. Mm. Very good. OK, right. So I'd just like to we're... say I'll have to leave early because I've got the pandemic scrutiny at six o'clock and I've got to have a bite to eat before then because it doesn't usually finish till half past nine. <laughs> I'll tell you what, then, if, if we can, if we move on to the next section, hopefully we can finish the, the next one in 15 minutes. And right. then if for those that want to stay, I wouldn't mind just a quick 10 minute chat just about how you found the commission, if they think there's anything we could have done better or anything you would have done differently or whatever those kind of things. I'd be just been interested to know because obviously this might be our last meeting depending on whether we decide that we want to meet again but um do you want to move on to the next section then uh, Steph? yeah so we had nicola said from market in cheshire and rob rob charnley who came to the final one around policy and promotion and um, the key themes that came up around that was really one of the positives out of lockdown about people accessing local information helping people appreciate what was going on in their local area I think working with Marcus and Cheshire and the LEP, I think previously their their targets and their um their focus had been really about attracting visitors and attracting people who were far away. Whereas from from the pandemic response, it was about attracting local people to shop locally, to engage locally. Um, I think some of the sentiment um uh, research they did was around people wanting to live in nice places and um, where where there are good things to do so the local pleasures campaign that they did were, was really su successful and um, i think what they also found through working with our reg services and also with the um, businesses that attractions and the retailers were really innovative and they were developing ways to maintain their existing um customers were quite agile in doing that so whereas some of the larger operators were quite slow to move um, a lot of the smaller operators were really quick and, uh, and agile to develop new new things um, I think she also looked at the focus around next year's campaign um, and really thinking about how you could see things quickly by foot um, one place what was in a five or, or ten minute walk and I think we have seen that as part of the national um, approach by Visit Britain as well 
Um, I think the changes in planning legislation Rob took us through, um, it re really did talk about uh, greater flexibility about change of use without needing app uh, planning applications, making it quicker and cheaper for the people who are using those spaces. I think that picks up on, on something Charles mentioned earlier as well about the different use classifications. Um, so I think we know that there's some big changes coming around planning. Um, I think out of centre business parks, um, we're maybe looking at non-office type activities, um, which obviously has run contrary to national and local planning policies where everything was around town. So it's how we interpret that um, and how we look at that going forward. Um, I think what Rob was saying is that it could actually look to help address some of the issues around empty properties in our in our centres um, and takes what it does take an element of control away from um, the, lo the local authority. And I think barrels or sorry, the planning authority and then that some of the issues we've had on data as well so if there's no record of it it's literally a visual inspection that we have to do to identify what those changes of use are and, and control some of that within our within our areas um, I think you talked about retail uh, new new build new buildings for retail coming forward for planning um, and thought of how they would be given other uses as well um, so that they could shift and almost be multi-use uh, so that you were future proofing it so that it wouldn't just be for retail it could quite quickly you move to some something else um, and then I think what he also talked about the flexibility in future for planning officers um, around the greater role of placemaking and really working closely with regeneration teams. So I have to say we do have a really close relationship with planning. Um, it's, it's a really um, productive relationship as well. We have some good good debates around what we'd like to bring forward um, and some of those policy levers as well. So if we just move forward to the recommendations, um, I think it was around the, de the destination management plan and really looking at how that talks to all of our areas and picking up on what Sam said earlier about the natural assets and think about how they appeal to the local visitor so really we're starting to work more closely with Marks and Cheshire and the LEP on our waterways strategies and thinking about what our longer term ambitions are for those as well as some of those smaller um, more localised offers Th really thinking about an ambassadorial role and amb ambassadorial approach for, for key representatives and stakeholders within within the borough if you think about people people's contacts and the, pe the people who they know it's really starting to um, embrace that and asking them to use their, their positions to help us, to help us gain visitors, to help us with some of our funding bids and really get our message out there. Um, and then there is, there's a typo on the next one. Uh, understand some of the planning implications in a lot more detail. So I know Rob um, and the planning team have done some member training. I think it, it's looking at how we respond to the reforms over the next um, two to three years as well. And thinking about the, the businesses coming in and the type of um, support, advice and guidance that they can get from us as well. So I think they were the recommendations from the final session. Um, hopefully we've captured as much as possible if there are if there is anything else happy to take any questions councillor beecham yeah i was because i think the new director's role with Gemma davis it helps to bring to helps us to become more of a place making council if you like um to have a kind of a director that's bringing together um regeneration and planning and uh, housing and everything else so i, th I think that's it's good and I, I think the recommendations in this they're kind of they need there's a degree that we need to be doing it now but it's also about a long-term shift as well in the way that we do things to to be people that do make beautiful places um that rob charney spoke about in his presentation and um, has any other members of the commission got any um points to make on these recommendations are we all happy with those charles um, it was just in relation to sort of some of the wider things and i don't know whether it may be better for AAB, but I did mention a number of times during various sessions, including this one, that I do think that each of the local areas just needs to consider how their car parking and pedestrianisation is working or not. Um, I mean, my, my gut feel is that for a lot of town centres, that we need to look at the, the pedestrianised areas and consider them more for sort of shared space because a lot of them were designed or they were created in the 1980s and 1990s, which was the real heyday of retail. And that, you know, the town and city centres themselves have shrunk. And I think that the, the importance of accessibility 
um, that some of these pedestrianised zones are, I'm, I think they're actually counterproductive in relation to retail. Now, um, I think it's up to each local area to, to, to look at that, but I do think the parking provision and the pedestrianised nature, those need to be looked at. Because I just, my gut feel is that is that more shared spaces and more sort of as the the click and collect, the curbside collection, as the Americans call it. I, I think that those need to be um, those those need to be considered. I think the the, the point you made about um, you, you know it being unique to different areas and for different areas to consider different aspects that affect them um, is important. I. Uh, I was talking to a business in Hall actually um, just the other day. They've over the course of the pandemic, their um, their business model it's almost a direct shift from where their revenue used to come from um, people walking into the shop and doing retail sales. And they started deliveries during the, the start of the pandemic, and now their their delivery business almost equals what their retail business was, and their retail business so it's a bit almost like a flip reverse on what, what we were talking about is how they want to continue to run a, um, a retail operation on a high street but they also want to be able to load um, their deliveries into their vans but because of the restrict parking restrictions on on Hall high street um, that you can't load anywhere on, on one side so i do think that there are highways type issues and ways in which the council can support uh, businesses to recognize some of the shifting patterns in um, retail that still maintain presence on high streets but that understand shifting patterns in consumer choice and, and, and everything else. I think the the idea that I mean there are, obviously the council's got a parking strategy that comes up for review periodically and I think that the, that they are assessed in in um, by location. I think that the the point about shared spaces and pedestrianization is very very difficult because obviously there are other interest groups that are that want to see more pedestrianisation, less cars in city centres. And as a council, we're always stuck in this difficult position between trying to satisfy lots and lots of um, different groups. So I think the point that you made about individual areas, local areas, looking at what it means for them in their particular area and listening to different people who make those arguments in those areas will probably be the key. Um, well, the yeah. yeah, I mean, that's why I think I think the word review is important is that whilst my gut feel is that pedestrianised areas really ought to be, you know, the default should they should become shared spaces. Uh, you know, that's my preferred view. But I think in relation to, to a recommendation, the recommendation should be reviewing it. So just, you know, to look at it, to see whether or not that should be so that people are happy with the pedestrianised areas and the parking um uh, you, you know the bits there so it's a bit like in 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 northwich where you've got short-term car parks and longer-term car parks and it's just that sort of thing and that could be re that could be reviewed uh, and also the basis that you've got a a pedestrianized zone that effectively starts in the bull ring and goes all the way up to the top of um to the top of witten street i mean it's a great pedestrianized area and the reason that was done 30 or 40 years ago is, you know, to get rid of the traffic. But actually, does that make sense now? OK, Sam Dixon. I, d I don't think I would actually support this being a re that, what Charles has just outlined being a, being a recommendation at this time, um, just because it's a very contentious issue. I mean, if you were looking at the place in the borough where businesses could have accessibility and people could walk freely and 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 you know people with all 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 different you know um needs or or people disabled people then you'd you'd look at Ells, um which has got you know loading at the back and pedestrian access at the front but the fact is nobody wants to go to Ellesmere Port at the moment um because it hasn't got a a sort of draw to it Whereas everybody wants to come, oh, no, not everybody, lots of people want to come to Chester because it's quirky and historic, but that makes it very difficult in terms of, you know, deliveries, accessibility um, and all of those issues. And and this is this is a whole sort of minefield, not a minefield. It's a really piece of work 
And if you pull in parking as well, I think it goes beyond the scope that this task force was actually set up to to cover. So I wouldn't support it being a recommendation. The, I do think it, it doesn't mean to say I don't agree that it isn't an important part of the vibrancy of town and city centres. I just don't think it in terms of recommendations for this piece of work at this time, we've covered it. Yeah, I also think because it's part of another piece of work about a 15 year strategy that's being delivered, I think that it isn't it isn't within the scope of the commission to be able to to influence it in that way. But I suppose it would be their, their ability to be able to influence it would be through the periodical reviews of that strategy. So I think I probably agree with you. Councillor Gibbon. Yes, um, one thing that's never mentioned in relation to parking is allocation space for bikes, cycles. And in North you see many youngsters drive, cycling the bikes up Whitton Street and things, but there is nowhere to park them. And we've recently had that as well in the uh, parks, Marbury Country Park, nowhere to put the bikes when they get there. And that is such a simple solution to provide some um, cycle racks for people to be able to, you know, park the bikes literally and um, so, we never mention that so i think under the i think you're right and i think under the um there was a, a, a the part about green in the city and about active travel um, that steph was mentioning before i think under that you know um secure cycle parking is something that's re repeatedly mentioned to me um about you know encouraging people to drive to ride their bikes into towns, you know, you know, with, which has CCTV coverage, which is well lit, that isn't just shoved around the corner behind a, a bin or something at the back of the high street that's visible. And, and I think I, I really do agree with you on that point, Lynn. Yes, and they need to sum up the main street so they can cycle to the main street, go to the shop and come out. They don't, you know, easy access, that's what I would say. Easy access. Yeah, you're right, Lynn, but it's, it's been looked at during the last few months. Um, because yeah. it came out in a funding stream was identified so areas in the the high street in north which have been identified for you know cycle racks that type of thing andrew mm -hmm. cooper has been looking at that because he loves things like bikes and trains right you hear the here first andrew cooper like, likes bikes and trains right okay no, I, I um, did just, i've got to go back to to i mean we can we i'm sure there is a way of finding some words that we can all we can all live with to make it I, i'm not suggesting that we go and embark on a massive review on on pedestrianized zones and car parking in each area what i'm trying to say is that it is an issue that has to be recognized and that we need to have some form of way of wording that we can recognize that it is an issue because fundamentally for me that i couldn't possibly with with the background that I've got, you know, and as you may recall, Richard, I may have accidentally insulted the good people of all via Twitter a few days ago, um, which wasn't my intention. But that's how strongly I felt about, for example, that bit of the the, the car parking, the the outside the the shops being removed. And I understand why, you know, you provide more details, so it makes more sense. Still think it's the wrong decision, but it, I now understand the decision making process. And that, to me, the the issue of car parking and pedestrianised is an issue that fundamentally affects um, town and city centres. And for us not to make any reference to it, 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 it would be a fundamental flaw. So I, I think, think the, the, there's a way of doing the words that we can make reference to that without undermining and destroying everything that you've done in terms of a car parking strategy. I, I, know, I, th I think I agree. I think it's about access and I think that's covered. And I think there was the, there was the discussions on transportation um, and, and uh, you know, active travel. And I think if if Steph's obviously listening to this discussion and w when that section's written, um, I think if, if we, we could, if we see on email how that comes back and Charles, if you're not um, you know, if you want to talk to me about I, that. I'm, yeah, no, I'm sure there is a form of words that we can we can all live with um, because I'm conscious that it, it can quite easily um, fall into a political argument, which I don't it very think much, it very much can. And I, and I don't want and I, I, I think the main point of this commission was about what the council needs to do to influence the, you know, the change you know change, changing consumer habits and about what we do about empty space and meanwhile uses and public space and everything else and i don't we don't want it to reunite a, an age-old 
battle between our parties on, on car parking, I don't think. Uh, Sam Dixon. No, we definitely don't want to go there. Um, no, I'm, I jest. It is important. I do think that you have to, I, I agree with Charles, you, the, the report has to reference it. Of course it does, accessibility is key. Um, it, it was, my, my concern was about it being a specific recommendation, which I think would just um, head us into a direction that we, we've just, I think actually this this past hour and a half has been really, really useful in terms yeah, of yeah. Foc focusing us on what we think the really important issues are. And, and, uh, and it does come back to, you know, how do you get empty units back into use? Uh, and I know, I know access is is a really important part of that. But in terms of very quickly, how do we task this? You know, the the teams that we're going to task with the the wherewithal to get going on this sort of post pandemic revival. Uh, we need we need recommendations that are very specific and targeted. So thank you, thank you, and and I'd, I don't want to say that I don't I don't I don't disagree with you, Charles, but I just mm -hmm. think the recomm any recommendation would probably sort of take us into a different area. Okay, well with that in mind, let's see what the what the um, officers come back with in their report, what staff comes back with in the report. I think Lynn, I know I'm conscious you need to go and get something to eat. And yeah. um, what what we, I mean, if if I think we'll end the recording um, there, Bethany, and just. Thank, I would like to say thanks to everybody who's taken part in it, um, all of the um, witnesses and everything else and all of the work that people have done to bring all of these meetings together um, before we close and to thank members of the committee as well. And then when, when the recording is finished, uh, I wouldn't mind just a quick chat with some members of the commission about how they found it and anything else. Um, so thank you everybody for your time and your commitment to this cause and we'll look forward to seeing the, uh, the report within the next seven days. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Thanks um, Richard. If you want to speak to me at another time, I don't mind. Yeah, please do. Okay. Just give me a ring.